This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson. And Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, is out this week. It's an all-pet day this morning on Creature Comforts. The doors to our pet hospital are wide open, and we welcome all pet questions from the big to the small. With the continuing holiday season, we'll have some tips to keep your pets safe from harmful home decor and during holiday travel. So don't hesitate to join the conversation by phone or email. And if you have any general wildlife experiences, we always like to hear those. So join the conversation with your phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. If you ever miss the Thursday broadcast of Creature Comforts, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning, Dr. Major. Hope you're doing well this morning. Good morning. Yes, we're doing okay. Uh, it's uh, kind of kind of like a strange weather going on. It's fairly warm today, you know. Yeah, it uh, it does seem to bite. It can't decide whether it wants to be, you know, fall, maybe nice weather or, or cold weather. So I, I vote for the good stuff while, while we've got it. Definitely beautiful outside, though. Very, very, very nice. So um, you know that my cat is is one of your patients at the clinic, and he was due for Brevecto uh, about a month ago. But I know that you've had some issues, though, some supply chain issues, I guess. Uh, So um, in the case where if you go to your vet and and they don't have the usual, say, flea medication or something, uh, do you think it's a good idea maybe to just wait a little bit to see if it comes in? Or would you recommend folks maybe switching to something else? You know, if that's been working for you, which I think it has, I would definitely just wait. Uh, we should have some in. And most, it's, you know, we've had some supply chain, whatever you want to call it. I, I hate to use that word because it's used so often now. But we have had some uh, interruptions with our supply uh, of different medications. So we try to stock up when we can, but uh, we should have that in, uh, I would think, within a week. And my thought, too, was, as we mentioned, flea is an all-round problem for Mississippi, but at least in the winter where it's a little bit colder, they're not quite as bad uh, as they were during the summertime. So, uh, And you're right. I've, I'm a big fan of Brevecto. Uh, it works really and well. There, right. And there are other options. For example, Revolution uh, can actually uh, help prevent fleas or treat for fleas as well. It also does uh, prevent feline heartworm which uh, certainly can can happen. But uh, I think Brevecto is, is really an excellent drug right now, and uh, it uh, does a great job with both fleas and ticks. And my cat certainly is happy about it because the, he, certain, he does not like having that stuff squirted on the back of his neck. And it's funny because it reminds me of how quickly cats can co- sort of change directions because uh, usually I usually have a friend of mine come over to help me with it, and I hold the cat down, and he squirts the stuff on there. But as soon as that cat feels the first bit of it on his fur, he makes some, you know, the, those jolting moves. And half the time, I think we get most of it on there, but it's it's always an adventure. Right. He's not excited about it for certain. <laughs> and uh, cats do have very sensitive skin. And I've seen this, you know, where we've applied medication uh, to, the, excuse me, to the skin here at clinic. And they can uh, really react quickly uh, to that. But uh, it sounds like y'all have got a system down and can and can work it out. A lot of times a towel will help to kind of wrap the cat up uh, a little bit, make a taco or a, a burrito out of it. Burrito. <laughs> yeah, a burrito would be better. Uh, and uh, it does cut down on your scratches that you might get. Well, and that's the good thing, though. At least he, he, he tries to dart off, but so far it hasn't gone the scratch route. So, Although I will say I went to visit my brother at uh, Thanksgiving, and he has a cat. And I, the cat came up to me, was sort of sniffing around, and I was holding my hand down there, and the cat was just, you know, sort of sniffing. And then all of a sudden he hissed and bit, bit my hand. So I don't know if he, he smelled my cat or whatever, but I thought that was odd that he was very docile. And then all of a sudden got something that he didn't like and kind of chomped down on my hand. So um, He was checking you out. Yeah, I, 
You know, and we've seen that. I don't know the history on your your brother's cat, but uh, quite often when a cat has been raised by an orphan, as an orphan, mm-hmm. uh, they and with no siblings, quite often those cats will n- never bite. <laughs> so I don't know what where, when he adopted that cat or when he got it, but certainly it could be could enter into why he did that. I don't know. But that's uh, that. The thing too is, as you said, cats uh, are very sensitive. So you do have to, especially if it's not your cat, you do have to be careful when sort of interacting with them. Because if you you know hit something that they don't particularly like, they're certainly going to let you know with either a paw or a, or a bite. I think. <clears throat> and always remember, with cats, uh, you get to know your cat. You think you know it, but then all of a sudden it acts like a different cat sometime. So, <coughs> excuse me, they have their different personalities. So uh, we've made it through Thanksgiving. We're sort of in the holiday season uh, here at the end of the year. Um, and, you know, I don't think it ever hurts to kind of re-remind people of the holiday hazards they need to think about uh, when it uh, comes to uh, pets in the holiday season. Exactly. And a lot of times we'll have uh, electrical cords out, which uh, are different in the house, and either for a Christmas tree or for wreaths or something like that. And a lot of times pets will chew on those cords and can get a pretty good electrical shock. We see it in cats more than dogs, but uh, they, uh, for some reason, they like to do that, to, to bite into it. Uh, and, of course, Christmas trees are always nice. The natural Christmas trees have such a good smell and everything, but be careful with what you put in the water for the Christmas trees. Either make it where it's covered but your pets do not need to drink that water, especially if you have something in it, like a preservative to help extend the life of the tree. Um, a lot of travel that goes on during this uh, time of year. <clears throat> if uh, you're planning on traveling with your pet, uh, obviously, uh, number one would be, you know, a, a carrier is, is important. But uh, might it help to maybe take some short trips maybe around the neighborhood just to make sure that your uh, dog or cat does well in kind of a couple of test runs? Absolutely. And uh, some of the pets really enjoy getting in a car, especially dogs. They, you tell them, hey, let's go for a ride, and they're all, like, bouncing around ready to go. <laughs> uh, cats, on the other hand, I would highly recommend anytime you're transporting a cat to have it in a carrier. Uh, somebody was talking about the cat the other day. They had two cats in the car. And neither were in a carrier, and they literally attacked the driver. And certainly that could be dangerous. Uh, They can get upset and uh, certainly hysterical. And you just don't need to have a wreck uh, based on having your cat loose in the car. And the other thing is to secure the carrier, where if you should have a wreck, which hopefully you wouldn't, that that carrier uh, does not just float loose in the car and use the seat belt to secure it. Uh, and there are other things that you can use, for example, if a larger pet that you don't have in a carrier. Uh, certainly uh, there are harnesses that will work with the seat belt uh, to help protect uh, the larger animal, like a golden retriever or a big dog. And then, too, I would say if uh, you're going on a trip that requires, you know, the humans to stop and stretch at a rest area or whatever, don't forget about your pet. Let them out. Uh, I know most uh, rest areas have, you know, the pet area, pet runs, that kind of thing. So uh, they need kind of stretching and and relief of the of the car drone uh, as much as us humans do, I guess. Right. And here's the thing with that. Always be careful. I'd pick up fairly for you and consider a secluded area. A lot of people that have their pets there may not be picking up uh, PCs or this sort of thing, and you don't know who's been there. And that's one reason to have your vaccinations up to date, but also to have your flea control uh, in in effect. Uh, Also, the other thing I highly recommend if you're traveling with your pet, to have a microchip. Uh, So if for some reason that pet uh, did get away, uh, you would be able to hopefully identified as your pet and most of the vets and most of the shelters do have a reader where they can actually read that chip and through going back to the uh, uh, supplier of the chip the company and can actually find the owner so that's a great thing to have and i would definitely recommend if you're traveling to do that the other thing 
if you're going to have your cat with you and you've got a long trip, I would provide a litter box uh, maybe somewhere in the car where the cat can get out and exercise, not while you're moving. But cats do pretty well as far as their carrier is concerned. They, they like it from the standpoint of protection, uh, and they, they feel secure in a carrier. Uh, so be very careful. I would not recommend taking your cat out for a walk at a rest stop. I think that would be disastrous, even if you had it on a harness. Uh, one quick follow-up on the uh, the ID chip. Is that something that maybe an office visit, you could come in and get it done, um, you know, just coming by the office? Yes, it's it's pretty much an in-and-out uh, type thing, make an appointment first. But certainly the chip is uh, very important, in my opinion, uh, as far as the identification of your pet. Should it get lost? If there's Sometimes there's an ownership uh, thing that comes up. Let's say that you have a, a black lab. Uh, and there are hundreds of them in the area, uh, you would like to be able to identify that dog as yours. And of course, there are other ways to do it as well. But it does help to have a positive identification chip. This is Creature Comforts, and it's time for our first break of the hour. When we turn, we will be looking for your pet questions for Dr. Major because we've got some open phone lines. Or you can call and share your other creature encounters. To do that, the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. Stay tuned. We're back on Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major. Uh, if you want to join the conversation with a pet question this morning, you can give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Looks like we've got a couple of questions being lined up on the uh, phones. But, Dr. Major, first a, a quick email. And it starts out by saying, our golden retriever dachshund mix. And I guess I can stop right there and ask... Is it unusual or any problems when a big dog like a golden retriever and a dachshund that's that's kind of big and small they're they're quite different types of dogs. True and to tell you that there's going to be a problem I really don't know. Uh genetics is a wonderful thing and there's a tremendous amount of uh potential. Uh I w- I've seen you know, Basset uh, Golden Retriever mixes, uh, all kind of different type mixes, but there could be some problems, but probably, in reality, probably it's going to be fine. And on something like that, does it look more like the Golden Retriever or the Dachshund, or is that up to the genes? Again, going back to genetics, it, it, it could look, uh, you know, hard to say. Uh, I, I would say that, yes, they could look like some of both. We have the questions all the time when we have pets come in, uh, people ask, uh, you know, what what kind of dog is this? Uh, I can tell them in most cases that they could go and uh, purchase a uh, genetics uh, uh, actually test kit, and uh, certainly they can find out exactly. And usually you're surprised as far as the they usually give you four or five different breeds ancestry, and uh, a lot of times it's a surprise of what it might be, but. Uh, you know, I would not intentionally, this is my opinion, I would not intentionally breed a, a dachshund and a golden retriever. I think that could be a mistake. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's a six-year-old, the, the email, uh, and a rescue, um, about 30 pounds. A few years ago, uh, they noticed a small, like, bump on his chest. The vet said it was a fatty tumor or limpo- a lymphoma and that it was nothing to worry about in the fast Fast in the past few years, it's grown into the size of a small marble. It doesn't seem to bother him, but it always worries me. Should I have it looked at again, or is that normal with fatty tumors? You know, they tend to grow, and that is a place that we see a lot of uh, the lipomas. I would suggest that if you're worried about it and it doesn't feel quite right, get your vet to do a fine needle aspirate, uh, not necessarily to remove it, but just a fine needle aspirate to see if it's fatty tissue or possibly some other type growth. I think that would be, one, reassuring if it's just fat uh, to just monitor it. We do see some lipomas that get big enough where they're causing problems either with uh, walking uh, or, you know, depending on where they are. 
So they can get quite large. I've seen lipomas that probably were two or three pounds, which is a big lipoma. Mm-hmm. So talk with your vet and maybe have a fine needle aspirate done. Just it's a biopsy and see what see what's going on. All right, very good. Got a couple calls to get to, so let's start on the phone lines with Emily calling in from Hattiesburg. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. I was curious if there is um, a spay and neuter clinic in the Brandon, Jack, or Brandon Slowood, uh, Greater Jackson metropolitan area that which, uh, that spays and neuters um, feral cats. Because we're, my na- my, a friend of mine is feeding a neighbor's cat that comes up and eats. And there are two more. There's a. Um, there are two more tabbies that have come up. One, you know. So, I was just curious if there's someone that does it at a discounted rate or does a feral cat. Um, I would. I would I'm definitely. In getting a, I would, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would definitely give uh, the Big Fix Clinic a call. Uh, they do at a discount, very reasonable uh, cost. And some of the veterinarians work with different rescue groups to also do that. Uh, your Mississippi Animal Rescue League, for example, uh, will issue vouchers uh, possibly to help with the cost of, of that. Others, CARA, uh, these different groups can help or assist with that. But I've checked first with Big Fix uh, Clinic. It should be, I don't have the number, but it should be in, uh, able to retrieve Okay. You said, could you repeat that, please? The big six, are you saying? Big, F-I-X, big, as in big, fix, F-I-X, big fix. Okay, now I got you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Well, okay, and this, 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 do they also give your shots? Because, um, you know, we need to get them. I'm interested in getting, I'll pay, a, you know, a, step, a small amount for them. Because right. they need to be have their right. shots, too, before they go back to their colony or wherever they are. Right. Need to check with them about that. I can't speak for them, so they might be able to, okay? Okay. Okay. Because I have a family cat at home that I feed in Hasbrook. Thank you. I enjoy the show. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thank Good you. to hear from you this morning. Let's uh, move on. Uh, next, uh, Fletch has called in today. Good morning, Fletch. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, much to my surprise, I just saw a bald eagle on Highway 25 just south of the Carthage exit. Um I've never seen one on some roadkill. Right. That's that's interesting. But, but yes, they they will go to uh, roadkill or dead animals. And uh, I think the ones in that area primarily are fish like shad or uh, those type of fish that they can get. But they will do roadkill. And uh, I've seen. I actually have seen. Uh, a bald eagle on on a dead animal, so that's certainly certainly possible. I was hoping there Thanks was enough for your call. livestock for them to eat fish and stuff around the rest. There he is, but I I, I think they're opportunists in this situation, and uh, that is an unusual observation to see it close to the road like that. Thanks for your call. Thanks, Fletch. Good to hear from you this morning. Uh, Got some open phone lines on this All Pet Day. If you have a question about your pet for Dr. Major, the number to call is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can always email the show as well. Send it to animals at mpbonline.org. Here's another animal, uh, another email that is about an animal. Uh, My 10 year old Maltese has begun showing some odd behavior. He wasn't too well trained to begin with, but now it's uh, like what training he did have is gone completely by the wayside. He's begun going to the bathroom in the house, becoming excessively needful of attention, barking more, chewing on wires in his leash, will not walk on the grass to go to the bathroom, and is very hyperactive. Do I need to take him to a doggy therapist? I would start out with your vet. Uh, certainly, I think that would be wise to have just a general checkup, maybe a blood panel run. Uh, there could be some things. Uh, he's a little young for what I would consider dementia. Uh, there may have been some changes at home that could have affected his, uh, you know, his ability. I don't know, but I'd start off with your vet. There are dog therapists, uh, people that can discuss uh, behavior with you. So first thing I would do, though, is have a general checkup and see exactly what might be going on. 
So there might be some sort of physical problem that's causing the dog's behavior to change like that. Right. For example, arthritis can cause some very severe uh, changes, or not very severe, but changes in defecation and urination. Uh, Certainly that could be a problem. I'm not sure why the dog is not wanting to go out on the grass, uh, but there's some something has triggered this, and uh, I would say that uh, there may be an underlying cause that needs to be addressed, such as arthritis, uh, or there may be a heart condition. Just a general checkup should help shed some light on what what's going on with this dog. And a therapist, I guess, maybe would sort of observe the situation but then i guess it would be pretty much maybe like a uh obedience class it's a similar way to to try to retrain or retrain a dog i guess right and they the therapists uh, that are available have been schooled in uh you know psychology about in trying to change habits uh and would have advice on what might help with this dog so that would be certainly a, an avenue and an approach to trying to correct uh, these these habits, I guess you would say, or the things that this little dog is doing. All right, very good. We got some phone lines to get uh, phone calls to get to. Let's start again with Rich calling in from Fannin. Good morning, Rich. Go ahead, please. Hey, um, thank you for taking my call. I live near the reservoir on the Fannin end of things, and I have not seen. I've seen a a flock of pelicans look like they're coming in for a landing, but that was way back in early October. Now I don't see any on the, on the Pelahatchee Bay area. And I'm wondering if some of the uh, spraying for that, uh, for that uh, invasive um, plant has run them off or if they're, they're somewhere else on the res and I'm going to hang up and listen to the answer. Sure. Thanks. Sure. Okay. You know, that's a great question. You know, I, I have, uh, over the years, surprised at the number of pelicans that are available. And apparently they migrate up and down the Mississippi River uh, quite extensively. Uh, Libby could add to this uh, better than I, but I suspect that they move around based on food source. Uh, I'm not sure that the spraying for the, those uh, invasive weeds or plant weeds that are in the reservoir would cause them to move, but I suspect they'll be back. Uh, And it's just a matter of, you think about food source where they're getting food, and uh, I'm sure there are plenty of them on the the Mississippi River up and down. And that's about the extent of my pelican knowledge. (laughs) Uh, but you're right. You know, we've talked about that before where, you know, all animals have to eat. And so they're going maybe to where the, it's a better source uh, for them to, to get what they need to eat and, and, and shelter. So uh, thanks for the call, Rich. We've got another call to get to. Now we're going to go to Mobile and Robert is on the line. Hello, Robert. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you for taking my call. I have a question simple about flu medicine for dogs. Uh, she's taken uh some medicine in the past, internal, a pill, and not a pill, a chew thing. And, uh, but I quit those and went to a spray on the body then cleaner. And I don't ever give her a bath. She's two years old. And I'm uh, wondering which is better for the dog, the medicine they take internally or the flea spray? And can you tell me the name of the flea spray? That would be good. Uh, Adams flea spray, and I think is there one called Trifecta? That's the pill, I think. So. Trifecta, Trifecta is a pill. The Adams flea for, spray is very effective. It does not last a long time, but it certainly can help in clearing up a flea infestation. The Adams spray uh, is one of the older ones on the market, but it's still effective, and uh, I don't think you're going to hurt your hurt your dog by using that. Uh, that's a great question, though. And the pill, if you were doing Trifexis or Brevecto, either of those, of course, Trifexis is a multi-faceted uh, uh, pill. It prevents heartworms and it kills intestinal worms and fleas. So certainly that would be one of the go-to type preventions. But Adam certainly as a supplement or used when you see fleas, certainly can cut down on the number, and it is effective. It just doesn't last long. Yes, I really like it. I, 
I'm afraid of uh, the pill. You know, like okay, oh. and I, I understand that. It's an excellent question. And uh, I would, if it's working for you, I would continue to use that spray. Okay. All right, Robert, thanks for the call. And, yeah, I think just like humans, a lot of times different medications work better with different kind of pets and that sort of thing. So, as you say, Dr. Major, if you find something that's working, uh, just keep up with it. Next, as long as, not, as long as it's not hurting the pet, yeah. Uh, Chico is up next in Oxford. Good morning, Chico. Go ahead. Good morning, y'all. I just wanted to offer a, a denim to the caller that uh, had the story about the eagle enjoying some roadkill. Right. 30 years ago, or over 30 years ago now, I was at sea in Alaska on the, on, on the Bering, on the PB Northern Victor between Alaska and Russia, and we were fishing for pollock by net, and of course all sorts of things would come up with the pollock, and those things landed on the deck of the ship before they went back over the side to become feed for other things, and it was almost commonplace for eagles to land on the deck to enjoy whatever we were keeping. <laughs> and uh, it, it was, I'm going to tell you, those things were scary. They're big. They're <laughs> huge. And they were not afraid of us humans one bit. I think <laughs> they thought we were putting out a buffet for them. <laughs> they, that's that you're right it, and, and in fact it was chico so uh, they probably yeah. enjoyed seeing the ship come around well i just wanted to offer that all right thanks chico great, great. that's a great story uh you know a lot of people uh think the eagle is always swooping down and getting a fish out of the lake or river but they are pretty uh tuned in to carrion which is dead animals and in that case they were taking advantage of the uh, fish I know that uh, in Alaska, when I was there, that they're almost as common as we would say crows. I mean, they're they're just just about everywhere up there, and uh, they're looking for uh, food, obviously, uh, either washed up food or going out and uh, securing uh, live fish from the water. And I would agree with Chico. If you've ever, if you've ever seen a bird of prey up close, they are somewhat of an intimidating uh, creature. So, um, thanks, uh, Chico. A, Go ahead. They have a swag. They have a swagger. They're kind of a swagger when they walk. Like, don't mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why there are so many sports teams that use those names, because uh, you know you, your football team likes to have a nice fierce mascot. So, uh, Falcons, Eagles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, It's time for another break. When we get back, we'll continue taking your pet questions for Dr. Major. We've got some open phone lines again, so if you're a pet owner that needs some advice, give us a call. The number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. We'll share some holiday plants that could be harmful to your pet after this. No matter if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone, Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology for tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson. Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, is out this week, so it is an all-pet day. If you missed any of today's show, you can always subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB public media app. And we've got some open phone lines, so if you have a pet question this morning, give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 877 Six seven two seven four six four. You can email us as well. Send it to animals at mpbonline dot org. So, Doctor Major, uh, holiday plants uh, and uh, harm to pets. Uh, which ones uh, uh, come to your mind when we talk about that? All right, uh, we'll get Doctor Major back on the line here in just a second. According to the ASPCA, there are some uh, plants that you should be concerned about. Uh, when it comes to your plants, the first one on the list is the, the naked lady or the belladonna contains toxins such as a uh, licorine that might cause vomiting, abdominal pain, uh, hypersalivation, decreased appetite and tremors. 
Um, Holly and Lily's also could uh, could uh, pose some problems. And the one I think um, most folks have heard of, uh, Dr. Major, mistletoe and poinsettia. So in, in general, what are your guidelines and thoughts about uh, keeping your pets safe around these uh, plants during the holiday season? Right. A lot of times we get a wreath or uh, maybe a, a table setting, you know, uh, for a centerpiece. And I, I noticed that uh, uh, one that I got had a lot of different type plants in it. Uh, some that I've never seen before, and uh, I would say that be very cautious with those. Uh, back to the mistletoe, I would avoid mistletoe. Uh, poinsettia has been kind of downgraded a little bit, um, that it's not highly poisonous, but it certainly can cause salivation and uh, emesis or vomiting. Uh, some of the others uh, that I come to think of, certainly the belladonna-type plant uh, is it's very toxic, and I'm not sure how many arrangements or whatever would have that as part of it. Uh, cats especially like to chew on things, and they'll pull out something and just because they like it and will chew on it and then have a toxic-type reaction. The peace lily, the lilies uh, certainly can be very toxic. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I would su- suggest that most any type of a lily-type plant could be toxic to a cat or a dog if they ate it. Oh, great. Um, and the uh, ASPCA recommends maybe opting for a silk or faux uh, plant, and I would think that the advantage there is if, if it's a nice-looking one, you know you've got it for, for several years in your holiday decorations. Right, and, you know, certainly that's, that's a possibility. It depends on your pet, too. I know uh, one of my cats just sits there and kind of looks at it like he's trying to decide if he wants to pull something out of that arrangement. (laughs) Uh, And uh, others, you know, uh, may totally ignore it. So you got to be careful with that. And we're bringing inside plants in. Uh, uh, Probably it hadn't been that cold, but still plants that we might have had out on the patio or otherwise. Bringing those in, we need to inspect those several things. One would be animals that are living in those plants, and the other thing would be be sure that there's no toxic plants that we're bringing in. All right, got some more phone calls to get to. We return to the phone lines and begin with Greg from Biloxi. Go ahead, Greg. You're on the air with us. Hey, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, Two observations uh, or or comments. They're not questions, but uh, one is I have a, a friend in Texas uh, he's actually engaged to my niece, and he told me over the holiday that he deve- he's a software uh, guy. He has developed an app that is available now that you can have on your phone. You take a picture of a plant, and it will tell you if that plant is toxic to your pets, hmm. um, which I thought was interesting uh, in, in context of the conversation today. Are you aware of that? Dr. Major? What's, what's, what's the name of his uh, app? Oh, boy. Now, see, I don't know that, but uh, <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't do, know how many exist, but he did mention it. I, right. I do have one that's called Picture This, and similar to what you're saying, you just take a picture of it, the plant, and it tells you what it is and also would list if it is poisonous. But I'd love to hear what uh, his, if you can send us an email on that or whatever, what his app is as far as that. But this yeah, one I'll, I've got on my, on my phone is called Picture This, and it works okay, very well. I'll ask him. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Great. The other, Great. Uh, the comment about the eagles, and I was just wondering uh, how unusual this is. Uh, I have a farm in Texas, and uh, we have a, a problem with wild hogs out there. So uh, okay. we're, we're encouraged, of course, to kill as many of them as possible. Recently, my son shot uh, two medium-sized hogs out in the middle of a pasture. Uh, he went out there a couple of days later to drag them out of the pasture, and he, he swore up and down. He said, I am not exaggerating. I counted four different times. And uh, he said, Daddy, there was 11 bald eagles feeding on those, on those dead hogs in East Texas. Now, we haven't had bald eagles back there that I've known of until the last five or six years. Uh, Is it unusual to see a group that large? 
When there's food available, I think they could be there. That is a large group, though, 11 birds. Uh, I would say that uh, it's a wonderful sight, but I, I don't know that it's that unusual, okay? But uh, okay. Depending, certainly depending on where you are, and you indicated that you've seen the eagles in the last four or five years. And I think they have proliferated pretty much, um, I won't say everywhere, but we see a lot more here also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it was uh, it was interesting. I was thinking it'd be right. wonderful if we could set some cameras up to where we could get a picture of that larger group, and the future would really be something to see. Right, and if you come up with a solution of taking care of the wild hogs, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> Hey, Greg, uh, thanks for the call. If you do find out more information on that uh, app that uh, I think your, uh, was it your niece's boyfriend, something like that? Uh, Yes. Uh Fiance, sorry about that. Uh, Yeah, if you could find out some more information, if you could email us, animals at mpbonline.org, and we'd be glad to share that information with our listeners. Will do. Thank you so much. Thanks for the call. Um, Up next on the line, it's Edwin calling in from Biloxi. Good morning, Edwin. It's your turn. Go ahead. Oh, hey, thanks for taking my call. Um, Dr. Major, my question is regarding acorns. I hear that they're toxic, and I can't keep my dogs from eating it. Any thoughts on what I can spray in the yard that won't hurt the dogs that would keep them from um, eating the acorns? Have you got several trees that are producing acorns? Yeah, I got, and I one area I fenced off the yard, but the acorns still are trying to get over the area that I fenced. It's kind of right. a big inconvenience, and my neighbor has a big old tree that overlaps my yard that drop acorns. Removing the acorns would be your best bet. I don't know if they will rake up or not. You could uh, possibly do that. It's very difficult to keep the dogs from eating the acorns once they get used to it. Uh, it can cause some GI problems. Some of the acorns are probably very high in tannins, uh, and certainly they can cause diarrhea. Uh, because if, if the dog is the dog's not going to be like a squirrel to sit there and peel the acorn off, uh, it's going to eat the whole acorn, and right. certainly that can can cause some issues. Uh, I would try to remove the acorns if you could, and that may be a very difficult thing. And of course, you know the wild animals, uh, deer love acorns, uh, and a lot of animals get along quite well without having a problem, but I'd certainly try to remove the acorns if you can and uh, kind of observe your dogs and see how they're doing. Okay. I wish I knew of a good tool. I didn't. Go ahead. I wish I had better information for you, but we do see that fairly often at the clinic, and usually it's not a toxic problem. By that, Mm -hmm. the dogs usually aren't that sick other than causing diarrhea Uh, and a certain amount of... uh, uh, what shall I say? Just caution is is advisable. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you for your call. Thank you. Appreciate. It. Thanks, Edwin, for your call. It's time for the last break of the hour. It's an all-pet day today on Creature Comforts. Doctor Major will remain here throughout the hour, ready for your pet questions. Join the conversation with your call. The number is one eight seven seven MPB ring. It's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four or email animals at mpbonline.org. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Creature Comforts here on MPB Think Radio. I'm Java Chapman, and believe it or not, we have a lot of phone calls to get to. And Kevin Farrell, our normal host, he had to step away for just one moment, but we don't want to keep you waiting. So Dr. Troy Major is here ready to talk with our next guest, who is Bill in Meridian. Go ahead, Bill. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Hello. Yes, Bill. Go ahead with your Yes, sir. Go ahead with your question. Okay. Uh, Dr. Major, I first of all, on the issue of poinsettias, my dog ate an entire poinsettia last year, and it didn't bother him at all. He, uh, I mean, he ate it down to the root ball. <laughs> okay. But uh, I, I took him to a dog park for the first time 
uh, over the Thanksgiving break, and his behavior was a little bit confusing to me. When I let him in, he would run up to, whether it was one dog or ten, he would run up, and his hackles would be up, you know, hair on his back. But his tail would be wagging, and he did well for the most part, but if a dog tried to dominate him, he would get scrappy about that. He had, you know, two or three little dust-ups, but nothing serious. But I didn't know how to read that, uh, where he's, his tail's wagging like it always does, but his, his hair on his back standing up. Yeah, I think that's a good observation there. I would say this, that in my opinion, what he's doing is say, hey, I'm here. I would like to be a play, but if you come after me or whatever, we're going to have problems. That's my opinion of what's going on. It sounds like what happened. Uh, Just being on guard a little bit. I think that's it, and he's letting other dogs know that that he's not going to be a pushover. <laughs> I guess that's the best I way I can you. describe it. Anyway, well, he seems to appreciate do well. That. He seems to do well with most dogs. And you know. Uh, was that his first? Was that his first time at the park? It was, but it, we went uh, every day for about five days, and uh, he did not. He was the same every time he went in. Okay, so that's just his personality, and I think, uh, you know, I would say that it depends on the dogs that are there that it could be an issue if they got into a real scrap, uh, but uh, hopefully not. Appreciate your call. That's good information. Okay. Thanks, Bill. We appreciate that. <clears throat> We've got uh, another caller on the line. It's John calling in from Bentonia. Good morning, John. You're on the air with us. Hi. Uh, good morning. There, There's a, an innovative uh, uh, T-post and netting type wild boar trap system that, that seems to work just amazingly well. And I actually saw a video where they tested it at Mississippi State, too, one, one of the multiple videos about it. All right, and so you know, but I imagine if someone were interested, a, a, an online search uh, could reveal the details on that. Yeah, it's actually it's actually called Pig Brig, P I G B R I T. I like that. That's very clever. I, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. I would imagine that uh, Mississippi State and the Extension Service would have some good information about that particular item. That sounds great if it if it works. And, 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 and they have they have they tested it, you know, and they've got an excellent video on their test. You know, it's not as impressive as some of the other YouTube videos, but, you know, it, it's scientifically, uh, you know, legitimate, I think. But if it works, yes, that's that's the main thing. All right. Yeah, basically, you, you, you tie the sides up. You know, it's real simple. You just drive in a series of, you know, a circle of T-posts and then tie this, this nylon netting to it, and you tie the net up, bait it with, with corn in the middle for, you know, a few days, and then drop it, and 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 you make it so you just anchor the dropped portion, and and they run to get to the corn up under the edge of the the drop netting, and then when they try to get out, you know they can't run up the netting, and in a, you know it'll trap boars and anything, you know, huge huge pigs. All right, uh, John, appreciate the call. Pig Brig, a uh, great title for that uh, product there. So, uh, Dr. Major, we'll wrap things up for today. Uh, Java Chapman, our producer, found a, a list of the top pet names for 2021, so we could go over these, maybe have a little bit of fun. Uh, for top female dog names for 2021, Bella, Luna, Lucy, Daisy, Zoe, Lily, Lola, Bailey, Stella, and Molly. Um, interestingly enough, my friend has several dogs, and their three of his dogs' names are Bella, Luna, and Lucy. So they did the right thing naming there. Uh, top male names for dogs, Max, Charlie, Milo, Buddy, Rocky, Bear, Leo, Duke, Teddy, and Tucker. Uh, any of those names on either list grab you, Dr. Major? <laughs> like all of them do. I think I, I, they may be all at the clinic right now. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, th- those those names are, are very, very very, I won't say common. They're great names, and uh, I've had a Lucy and Lily, and I've got one that's named Mercy now because it's Mercy Me. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that's those are good names, and uh, it, it's amazing how they kind of 
gravitate to certain names. And I'll be honest with you, I've seen just about every name that you can imagine, but those are very uh, good names, and uh, we see them often. And for the cat list, the female names, Luna, Bella, Lily, Lucy, Nayla, Kitty. Then that can, that's kind of, I mean, come on now. You can do a little bit better than Kitty. Uh, Chloe, Stella, Zoe, and Lola. So a lot of shared names there. That's interesting. And top male names for cats, Oliver, Leo, Milo, Charlie, Max, Simba, Jack, Loki, Ollie, Jasper. No bow, unfortunately. Uh, but th- that's interesting because I think we see a lot of pop culture references in there, Dr. Major. Loki, I think, uh, one of the characters in the Marvel Universe. So it's interesting how uh, uh, pet names get tied up with our pop uh, culture references. They do. And, you know, those are all good names. I mean, I won't uh, say anything bad about any of those. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not too opposed to the kitty. Uh, remember that if you say kitty, the cat will come. And um, most cats will come to the word kitty, so it's a common name. And we have a mama kitty here that's a clinic cat, and she knows her name. Uh, But, yeah, that's that's good. And uh, two other names inspired by the pandemic were Fauci and Zoom. So, (laughs) Okay. We'll leave that alone. Okay. (laughs) Okay. All right. Um, Those are good. Yeah. Uh, Hmm? Oh, sorry, we've got one final call to get to. My bad. Uh, Bill's on the line. Sorry, Bill, go ahead. Yes, I. it's Bill in Jackson, and I have an indoor-outdoor cat, and I'm very grateful that he goes outside to use the restroom, but I have one particular flower bed that he uses as his box. Is there anything that I can do um, add to the ground cover, I meant to the... Um, mulch or spray or anything that I can do to cut that down. <laughs> he likes that particular bed. It's going to be a difficult thing to do. You might uh, put a heavy planting of ground cover in, uh, you know, just to make it where there's not a lot of soil available and provide an area somewhere else for him. With They like loose, fairly loose soil or mulch, so you might provide an area nearby but try to fix that where it, it, it would uh, deter him that's the best thing i wouldn't spray it with anything i think okay. that might be harmful okay okay thank you so much you have a good day all right thanks bill yeah dr major uh, you know uh, make the area you don't want him to go to unpleasant and make a nicer area where somewhere else where you do want him to go and that might work All right, that's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of mississippi public broadcasting think radio funding provided in part by listeners If you want to hear today's show or previous show, you can visit mpbonline.org slash creature comforts. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener today was Jason Klein. So for Dr. Troy Major, I'm Kevin Farrell. Stay tuned, because up next, it's autocorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio.